Before we begin, um, para escuchar en español, tienes que empujar interpretación y escoger español. Uh, for English, you need to click on... For English, you need to... You have the option... if you would like that. Um, and then we encourage everybody to introduce yourself in the chat. Please select all panelists and attendees. Let us know your name, where you're from, um, what country you're from and what organization. And for all your Q&A questions, for all the questions you have during the webinar, please put that in the Q&A um, Q box. So, bienvenidos a todos y ya empezamos. Este... Welcome everybody and we will begin right away. Executive Director of ESSAN, Elizabeth Lule, to give her introductory remarks. Over to you, Ariel. Thank you, um, Ariel. Uh, your Excellencies, uh, distinguished panelists, and dearest participants, warm greetings from the Early Childhood Development Action Network, the Inter-America Dialogue and UNICEF. It's always great to work uh, together on these uh, learning events. Um, <clears throat> the ECD Action Network is a, a global network that catalyzes collective <clears throat> action um, at scale uh, in search of greater impact. We advocate, we communicate, we share knowledge and learning and facilitate coordination and collaboration across um, multi-sectors as well as multi-stakeholder uh, partners. This webinar is a great example of uh, the importance of cross-country learning. And today we have 601 registrants uh, who are all slowly joining us. Uh, from 64 countries outside Latin America and 19 countries from Latin America. And first, I want to apologize that for this one, we do not have French translation, but we recognize the demand from all over the world, and we promise that we will have French translation for, for the next one. Uh, but first, I'm so grateful to uh, Ariella and uh, the other panelists uh, and to the government of Peru for being willing to share this great example um, of results-based um, budgeting. Financing is critical to um, scaling up and addressing the needs of uh, young children, their parents and caregivers, but it's also how governments allocate their budgets it's how they execute their budgets, but I think most importantly, it's the efficiency of how that money works at the end of the day to achieve real change and outcomes uh, for children uh, and their caregivers as well. So we're very grateful that you can join us and I'm sure we will have great questions coming from the um, other participants and other countries who really admire what Peru has done and the achievements and the innovations around your work. Um, over to you, Ariel. Thank you. Monica, good morning to organizers and colleagues and panelists and all participants. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak to you and your participation in this event. In the recent years, in Latin American countries have made great efforts and resources to increase coverage and strengthen quality of services for families and children under five. From EGDAN Dialogue and UNICEF, we have been supporting governments to consolidate these integral childhood development policies with interventions by combining sectors. We do this by identifying possibilities for exchange, collaboration in the region and cooperation between countries with evidence of programs which might be temporary. We are now talking about results-based budgeting in Peru. It's an example of this type of focus. Our aim 
we can move forward from challenges and reflection, but in particular, the policymakers for early childhood in the region. The case we present here, Peru, we have a process of policy making for early childhood with very special features which are of interest to a regional and even global agenda based on a broad intersectorial agreement those who are working on early childhood and are looking at designing evidence-based policies identifying which interventions have the most probability of producing results on children you will see that the answer of what results are wanted has a focus on sectorial products which must be included in the budgets peru is a case of sectorial coordination in planning and also developing tools for coordination in executing multi-sectorial aims. This links aims with policy instruments for providing services. I want to thank you for your participation. Thank you. Now I will introduce this wonderful panel. <clears throat> we have three authorities on the subject who will share with us a comprehensive view of the experience in Peru with ramifications for the whole world. First, we will listen to the presentation by Roger Salwana. He is the main author of the report which we are presenting today. Roger is the manager of ATIPAI Innovación para la Gestión, and has long experience in public management, including the Ministry of Economy and Finance in Peru. Then we will hear Ariela Luna. She also participated in the preparation of this report. In addition to many other things which Ariela has done, she was until not long ago, the Minister of Development and Social Inclusion in Peru. And from that position, she led the experience of results-based budgeting for early childhood development. Closing the panel, we will have Luis Miguel Castilla. He has also had a long career. He was Minister of Economy and Finance in Peru. He was ambassador for Peru in the US. He had positions in CAF and in BID and has been a mem and is a member of the Inter-American Dialogue. We're going to listen to the three of them and then we will have time for listening to your questions that you can send and give the panel a chance to answer those questions. Without no further ado, I invite Roger to give his presentation. Thank you, Ariel. Good morning, everybody who is listening to the webinar. Before I begin, I want to thank Ariel and Monica from the Inter-American Dialogue and UNICEF for the opportunity they have given us to do this work. We have really enjoyed it. We were part of the process, so it wasn't too difficult. We had to remember what we did and rationalize. So I'm going to show you a summary. Just let me know if you can see the PowerPoint presentation. It's a synthesis that uh, we are going to talk about. The effectivity of the state is the main issue, the main motivation for most of us to be here. How to make the state being capable of generating effective changes in critical variables of development. This is our motivation and this is what we as a team were motivated by. This is important because among many variables which are critical, there are some or many which are difficult. If you look at Ecuador and Guatemala, chronic malnutrition seems to have been stuck in the same place for more than 10 or 15 years with no change. 
and makes you feel like giving up, thinking it's impossible. Looking at Repub Dominican Republic, maternal mortality is high and persists. It's endemic. And outside the Americas, if we look at countries such as India, chronic child malnutrition is 35%, also prevalent and consistent, as is maternal mortality. But a country like Chile, for instance, malnutrition is practically controlled and at the level of developed countries. But this presentation is not about Chile, but about countries where it seems difficult to achieve these changes despite economic growth, even though we are making progress supposedly in many variables. And this is the case of Peru. Look, in Peru, chronic malnutrition like Guatemala is also prevalent. If you look over time, you can see on this slide, you can go back here to 1997, this red line remains here at this level. But something happened then. We did something at these between 2007 and 2008 that made this change. So what did we do differently? The answer is quite simple. We made results-based budgeting. Among other things, we think that the critical point is the change in the way policies are managed, public policies are managed, and how it's linked to budgeting management. This was the key to the change. Chronic malnutrition had great political support. It was the first time a president in his presidential speech or his inauguration speech established a goal. So this, he said that the chronic malnutrition at the end of his government, I'm talking about 2011, had to go down from 25 to 16%. It's a huge difference. Uh, before it was impossible to change and now we wanted to make a rapid change. Based on results, we wanted to establish evidence-based policies, first of all, to understand what we want to solve and then to define what has to be done, the solution. This is where we use evidence, evidence of the efficacy of interventions based on experience, international studies, longitudinal, all kinds of studies, meta-analysis, systematic reviews, what works best to solve the problem. That's what we will finance. Everything that was found that does work, we had to determine which was most effective because resources are scarce. So even if there are 20 interventions, we cannot finance all of them. So we need to decide on priorities. We also have to ha obtain understanding of the causes and solutions in the public expenditure structures. These are like the channel through which these waters flow and it has to reach fertile land. Fertile land in this case are the services that should work to provide results. So these programs were created reflecting results, in this case, chronic malnutrition. And we had interventions that needed to be done coming from the evidence of what actually works. This is the way we link the budget to the strategy. Uh, another interesting point was that the Ministry of Finance and Economy became a purchaser of results. The one that begins to trigger and ask questions and to decide according to what are priorities. Of course, it did it in the past. Ministries of Finance always allocate and have a role in this process, but in this case, it was as explicit uh, marriage or complicity or association need to get the results expected regarding malnutrition. They introduced innovations in the process like conditioning entities, budgeting, who provide services for malnutrition, telling them you'll have this budget, but you have to improve your management. The important here is implementing adequately what we have defined as what actually works. Another point, number five, is measuring. But in the past, we did not frequently need malnutrition or predictors or required services. We didn't have that information. So we began to make yearly measurements and but twice yearly 
measurements. And so we would check on children and record the results. We had information on which to base decisions and to make corrections. Another important change, and this has been done a lot, is to combine with the management of the processes. Traditionally, budget management, we usually see that as exogenous to others. Once the budget has been assigned, then it's a problem of the agency to do what they have to do. And in the bureaucratic model, theoretically works, but in real life, administrations all have their own interests and motivations, even within a particular agency, the people in charge of the processes respond to different intentions, interests, and motivations, excluding corruption, which I'm not even mentioning. Other interests often not connected to the priority. So the Ministry of Finance empowered in this way, controlling and monitoring critical indicators, whether the resource was allocated properly. The picture you see behind me is a river in the Amazon in Peru, reaching from place to place in this region needs a lot of organization and investment in fuel. So if the agency in charge of the service in that department did not budget for fuel to distribute vaccinations, then they won't have the result because the product will not be delivered. So the Ministry of Finance began to ask this kind of questions. This set up a virtuous circle leading to the reduction of malnutrition, chronic malnutrition, among other factors, of course, but this is how we see it from the inside. On this timeline, the budget begins 2006, 2007, the results-based budgeting. There is an important reform. People think this is a good reform. Then the Ministry of Finance, aware of that, tried to expand this as from 2011, expanded it in a great way. This had a good side, which was that the tool began to penetrate to all levels of bureaucracy but had the not so good side that the perspective of the priority became lost. This was a transition time. Another important point was the creation of the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion. So far, we've all only talked about up to there, up to malnutrition, but that's like the hardware. But the software is all this capacity to understand and reason interaction with the world all this uh, considers child development, not only malnutrition. So as from here, they began to promote insertion of evidence-based policies, strategies, see all the tools for, budget, for results-based budgeting. Begins, they begin to promote strategies, promoting guidelines for childhood, early childhood development based on evidence using causal focuses. The weak point of this process was that it was not accompanied by the look of the budget. Remember the previous slide said, link the strategy to structures and processes of expenditure. Otherwise, the first of just music, a lot of nice words, a lot of signatures, but which will not enter the management circuit. This was the weak point, but the Ministry of Development tried, created incentive tools and had some successes, which is not the topic of the of my presentation. In 2016, we entered into which lasts until today. In this process, what happened and logic. So there's a kind of relaunch of results-based budgeting, which I'll explain in the next slide. In relaunching based budgeting has a strong component of priority results. This looks like the first stage 
when mal chronic malnutrition began to be worked on. And these second, these have to be have priority politically and regarding budget. These priority means require programs to be approved at presidential level. In 2019, the programs were designed responding to this new results-based or priority budgeting. And there was something similar to the way the guidelines were made. The presidential approvement was obtained and it was ready to go. Early childhood development now has a budget program based on evidence with intersectorial, multi-sectorial legit legitimacy, political legitimacy, and is ready for implementation. We're doing this now. I will now move on to explain some of the restrictions that we have in this new stage, which is a challenge. Characteristic of this relaunched results-based budgeting. First of all, Results-based budgeting has been institutionalized. The law of budgeting has been changed. It's now called legislative degree for public budget. This involves result-based budgeting. They created three kinds of programs. Priority, pro priority products, le political legitimacy, other sectorial type programs responding to the 2011-2018 learning and another type which are institutional, not responding to results. This is all ap applied to the whole of public policy. What does this have to do with malnutrition, uh, early childhood development? The it prioritizes Early childhood development and second is violence against women. So there's a cross-sectional, multi-sectorial, intergovernmental program called PPOR, results-oriented plan for early childhood development approved by the president, con conducted by the Ministry of Economy and Finance. This is unprecedented. This Ministry of Economy and Finance inserting this strategy in budgeting. The Ministry of Finance knows that what has to be done and what the results are and will pay for that service. It's not substituting the role, but just ensuring that what will be financed is what actually works and is connected to the priority. This obviously continues to the principles of causality and scientific evidence, monitoring public expenditure continues. We reinforce this link between the products in the budget and the production line. There is a creation of new terminology to apply to public management as the set of processes of the budget planning. Imagine there's a village over there at that point of care multiplied by each point of care all around the country. And this is a relevant condition to the process. Then budget allocation, then supply chain, then provisions chain and user management. This is all more visible and it's driven by the Ministry of Finance. Ministry of Finance also takes on a key role in collaboration with this sectorial ministry, which has multi-sectorial supervision. They are given multi-sectorial supervision. And this is the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion. As the program is national and multi-sectorial, the ministries that take part have to supervise the products and establish protocols how the product will be implemented and the providers are the local or regional governments or other agencies of the national government. They define what the citizen will receive, the value promise, and somebody has to oversee this and then dis determine which agencies are going to actually provide these. The Ministry of Finance in our countries is able to generate this incentive has influence on all the other agencies. Finally, evaluation process changes. For those of you who are at work on budgets, the evaluation emphasis is no longer on impact. 
the emphasis is the evaluation of processes. We need to generate information to take decisions, mainly to improve processes where value is generated. Briefly, I want to show you, this is in the document or documents available, how to make this causal strategy visible for early childhood development. There's a conceptual model which enables you to understand the causes and identify the results. Then there's an explanatory model which is specific within the concept, specifically identifies what are the causes. This needs to be approved. This is all based on evidence. One case, for instance, Secure attachment, which is a result linked to social emotional development, will be affected by evidence, by situations such as women's postpartum depression. In this way, we identify the factors. I won't go into details, just want to show you how we build this strategy. Then there's a prescriptive model. So far, it's been understanding of the causes. Now we have prescription. So it's called prescriptive model. As I was saying, these are interventions which are analyzed as to how they complement each other and turned into products. The product will be inserted into the budget structure. These blue boxes here represent products. For instance, this box I'm pointing says children and their families receive a family ac accompaniment. This has been formulated as a conjunction of all these points on the left. People who provide the service go to the family homes. They will give them, among other, this is not exhaustive, these type of interventions, because these are the ones that work. They will be delivered through technical protocols, number of hours, number of visits, profile of the visitor. All this is defined based on evidence. If the evidence is not sufficient, it's defined based on technical decisions established by the designers. There will always be a gap between evidence and reality. In Peru, I explained results-based budgeting success in previous years and how progress was made towards a results-based project for childhood development. That's up to 2020. Right now, the agencies, especially the ministry, uh, are preparing technical guidelines for products, for services, for protocols, profiles, defining roles of all the actors at a specific level. This has to be standardized as far as possible. We are working with the Ministry of Finance on inserting this structure, the strategy in the expenditure structure. If you look at Peru's information system, the spaces have been created, but there is still a process which has not been completed. Then the production line processes have to start. Budget has to be planned according to what the village across the river needs. And this has to be done for the whole country. Then budget has to be allocated. This is a big challenge. And this is where we are working, making this production line work, this complex image, which I'm showing you here. To the right, we have already defined it. I know what the result is. I know what the product is. I need this to be delivered now. And this is what we're working on, the challenges in this delivery. And will this all finish? We understand that obtaining results in early childhood development is harder than malnutrition. Malnutrition is one factor among many which have incidence on the result of development. Now, we have a longer chain and it's more complex. The decisions are not necessarily taken or maybe they are taken. The problem is how to make them work and how to make commitments be accepted. This goes together with political instability in Peru now. 
in the end of 2020. They changed the ministry, Minister of Economy, the Director of Budget, and technical sections were also changed. This creates uncertainty because there are people who are not necessarily familiar with what we're trying to do. So there's a kind of a bubble right now, a parenthesis. And the, how do the ministries work as a team? How can they work to, the ministries work together? They need to work hand in hand. Finally, COVID-19, which stopped the implementation, which was supposed to be done in 2020 and has set us back in the implementation of the program. Together with the other factors, I would say these are the challenges we're facing right now. We could repeat the experience with malnutrition. I think we can, but it's gonna be very difficult. So I leave you here with these words of optimism saying that in Peru, if we've been able to learn the good things we have, we will be able to potentiate them and achieve excellent results for early childhood development in the future. Thank you, Roger. I'm sorry I'm not on screen. Thank you for this excellent presentation. I want to recognize several people who are asking questions, whether the presentation is available in English. The PowerPoint, unfortunately, we don't have it right now in English or we don't have the document either, but seeing there is so much interest outside Latin America, we will see how, not right now, but how we could soon have it translated. I now invite Ariela Luna to speak. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank the organizers for allowing us to share that experience. This has taken us back to 2008. I wanted to mention a few things. One point that allowed us to do results-based budgeting, it doesn't mean we didn't do it before in Peru, but I think what strengthened it was the focus the budgets for states in the past and now, as Roger says, relaunched results-based budgeting, looks at the citizen, focuses on citizens. This means that the logic model is done, the models that he explained, the production line, and then say, who gives the vaccination? Who teaches classes? And this is the sectorial aspect, which is important because states normally do not look multi-sectorial manner at citizens, but look at themselves. This is a major change. Second, as you saw, this is a combination of variables, a mixture of factors. Results-based budgeting important, political capital is important. Fortunately in Peru, we have managed to have all authorities after that able to put childhood on their agenda. Every authority has some childhood outcome on their agenda. Third, do things based on evidence. This is key and mainly that the personnel from the sectors that are working on in the interventions knows that that intervention is how it is related to results and what results are obtained. In 2008, a lot was done. The country, as I say, was evangelized in this model. We need a model that everyone needs to understand and know about, and some of them implemented. It's one single model for strategy, one single strategy. A clear law of production, which enables all of us to implement the same thing or support the implementation of it. Another important point is that this reform, we did 
all the incentive mechanisms, considering and co speaking to the different regions, signing agreements to get results. You need to you need to reach the results in all percentiles. Civil society participation is really important. Civil society and the state joined up and it was very important to have the participation of civil society. They have created monitoring or follow-up mechanisms to civil society created a series of platforms, making the information open. The population can follow how many children have the integral package. What In 2014, we had the integrated service package. Every Peruvian child must receive this package. In 2008, we had three interventions. Today, we have about 14, and the results-based budget has 30 but right now we have approximately 11 interventions within an integrated package which every child must receive in a timely manner at every specific age this has to be measured this is also important because it takes us to the citizen focus seeing everything according to the citizen's focus and the last thing we've been working at, which is, was approved the multi-sectorial budget for early childhood development created 30 products or interventions based on evidence. Two of them have multi-sectorial oversight. There are 28 should have sectorial oversight, but two, which is family accompaniment, going to the child's house to visit once a week, which depends on oversight from four sectors. This seems simple, but it's actually very complex. And we're right now at the ministry designing the technical way of how to work with this product. This will radically change the subject because we began to have multi-sectorial oversight products implemented in the territory. And this is the other focus, which is connected to territorial management. Territorial management for childhood is landing with the model, not just malnutrition, but early childhood development in the territory with a series of indicators. This process shows us that it is possible to do things, improving the quality of expenditure is important, Participation of Ministry of Economy and Finance of the countries is very important. And also the participation of ministries uh, such as Ministry of Social Inclusion. The Ministry of Social Inclusion is neutral, like the Ministry of Economy, which can pull the other sectors to articulate them and achieve results for childhood. This is also important, but confronts us with the challenges of governance, which are not simple. Governance is important in these processes, political governance, technical governance, budget governance, which have to be articulated, and also social governance. All this has to take, take us to a model which has to be managed in smaller areas. In our country, it's the mayors who will have this kind of leadership, and we need to achieve strategies for every Peruvian child to have that integrated package and more, and to have a system of alerts as they do in other countries. In synthesis, we wanted to present all the factors, but we have very short time to do it. I wanted to highlight that there's a, a combination of points. There are drivers such as results-based budgeting, but there are also drivers such as participation of civil society and the most important driver which is like the zoom screen it's having the focus on the citizen on the child and that based on this track work on all the strategies and the state has to align has to modify itself unify its action in order to achieve these results for children i'll tell you a story when we were working in the fund for promoting 
performance, we had a commitment, which was that all early education material for three-year-olds would arrive on March 1st, not late, but there was a region in the Amazon that was unable to comply. When I spoke to the governor of that area, I said, what happened? He said, minister, I was minister at that time. It's really difficult because that area, you can only reach it by small planes and the small planes are too small to take all the materials, the pens, the papers and all the materials that were being sent. And we don't have a number of planes that you could send them and said, why didn't you, I asked, why didn't you go by river? And he said, again, the boats are too small and the volume of material was too much. So I couldn't get it there in time. This kind of details you need to look at carefully to make them visible. And you have to go to where the children are, which is another challenge that we have. It's difficult to get to all areas. For instance, in our country, there are more than 400,000 people that live far from any kind of medium. And these are citizens just like everybody else and should have access to all of this. So there are a set of mechanisms which have enabled us not only to progress, but also to learn, to have more knowledge about what we need to do so that the service provided by the state for citizens should reach them. I think this is the main lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Ariela. Now I invite Miguel. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, UNICEF, the dialogue. It's very nice to see old collaborators and share with you results-based budgeting. When I entered in 2008, the Ministry of Economy and Finance, I was able to see partly the beginning of this reform process, and I'm happy that it continued, and especially that it was built on the positive. There's a tendency in the countries to clear out old things and start again. And here, what has happened was the process of learning and improving what was already established. So I'm happy that after so many years we talking about such an important subject, we could summarize the activity of the government of having increased budgets and not achieved the results desired is a problem of public management. In Peru, we are facing the limits of what public management can do in favor of citizens. <clears throat> I would like to mention, I don't want to repeat, we've had excellent uh, presentations and ex uh, by Roger and the experience of Ariela, but I think this is important to that we should see and not be complacent, con thinking that this is the panacea or the solution to every problem. It's not. What are the messages which are central moving forward? Some have been mentioned by my colleagues. What, will, what do we expect from this process in the future? I'm going to talk about some risks, challenges, and how to convert them into opportunities. When you speak about results-based budgeting, which has a unique kind of treatment and intangibility, uh, items are shielded in budgets and cannot be used for different Reasons. So this orders and protects these resources for the purpose they are destined to. Sometimes in a country with such a lot of precariousness as a result of the pandemic, there are other factors which are rigid and are sometimes 
undesired results. For example, there are other budget programs that are important. But what happens if an entity, a medical center gets, the, uh, what if they are, one of their incubators is damaged for newborns and there's no resources to replace it, but there are resources in a budget, results-based budget for nutrition, for instance, which is another one, which has also been positive. What do we do? Do we le let the child die because of a lack of an incubator to help it survive? Or do we maintain the logic of these programs and the of official has to take a difficult decision, either break the law, use those resources for something else and take on the responsibility for it, or save the child of a, the life of a premature child. So there are some rigidities which are involved. It's not the fault of the mechanism in itself, but perhaps it is because of the lack of effective interventions in other areas. A medical care center should must have a support regarding an incubator in this example. So what can we do about this kind of rigidness in the budget, which sometimes arise? Second, these are like islands of modernity in resource allocation, but it coexists with the large part of the budget, which is assigned in an inertial manner. And this is a reality which this is trying to go against, to go against this inertia, but the inertia is really complex, particularly now when the Congress is hyperactive in generating initiatives for expenditure, which don't have technical logic and are not evidence-based or results-based. Three, a third challenge is avoiding du duplicating programs. There's a program of early childhood development, which is essential, very, very important. But this coexists with other programs. How do we avoid overlaps? It's important because resources are scarce. And as we have seen, there are sophisticated systems of causality, of logical framework, of products. So it's important to avoid this kind of overlap and think about something, how to make it efficient and avoid those kind of short circuits. This is in terms of the risks. There are others, but looking to the future, I think we've already mentioned by Roger how to make the production line work. Ariela mentioned it in terms of the lack of access to healthcare centers in many cases. But I think here, talking about public management, one of the main problems in the country is this, how to accompany this effort of results-based budgeting with a system of supply and logistics in providing goods and services. This is something which is just beginning to be created. An administrative system created recently is not yet integrally adopted, but this is absolutely necessary and goes beyond budgeting. It's one leg, but without it, we will not be able to achieve the outcomes that we are seeking. This is completely necessary to move forward together. 
without a clear supply system, it's difficult to achieve the outcomes. There are certain improvements in the new version of results-based budgeting. There's a possibility of a delivery unit accompanying, ensuring adequate management and ensure that there are no logistic problems or supply problems, which are complicated in the Peruvian state. This debates about vaccination, which we are in right now, reveals a lot of these challenges that we're facing. Secondly, very often there's a lack of technical capacity. And I would add to this the instability in which we are, where there is no continuity of the people in charge of handling these processes. Technical capacity in Peru are not at the levels that they should be. There are many problems of lack of adequate management and high, very high rotation at all levels. This makes it complicated for the actors who have to move forward with these programs, especially failures that become magnified at the subnational level, regional governments and local governments. A third issue, and this one is positive, are incentives. Ariela mentioned this, the fund for promoting performance works. Incentives tend to work in the state. And I think that maintaining the adequate incentives for changes in behavior is essential as a component for maintenance or to be maintained. Two final topics. One is leadership. Leadership is essential. This work between the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the Ministry of Social Inclusion, this partnership was approved by a presidential level. When there's a change of administration in the country, it's essential that this partnership should continue, but this is not easy. Multisectorial oversight is difficult to organize. Oversight is complicated. So imagine if it has several different heads or subheads, it's a real challenge. This will depend on the president of the Republic at the highest level. This is essential. Finally, also regarding leadership is what we are seeing here, which is a state policy, not a government policy. This began with one government, continued with another government, has been maintained. I think that this continuity in public policies is absolutely essential. What we're seeing in Peru, where we are right now reviewing, uh, there's clearly a state policy with all the improvements being performed, focus on citizens and many others, many other improvements which are ongoing is a good reference, but I don't, it's, it's reference, but it's also full of challenges. And I think this summarizes what should be the agenda of public policies in a topic as important as early childhood development. This is it. Thank you, Ariel, for the time. And I'll be attentive to questions. Thank you very much, Miguel. Now we will begin with questions and answers. What we usually do is taking the questions that you have written in the Q&A and ask the panelists. We have had so many questions and so many, so interesting that we're going to have a, a last minute in the day. I'm going to invite three participants who asked, in my opinion, very good questions. There were many others too, but I would like them to ask these questions to the panelists. Paola Bernal has an interesting question about 
fairness. Paola, briefly, would you ask the question? Thank you. When we speak of results based focus, I'm concerned with this because we also work with this focus. When we do it this way, and it's so biased in terms of indicators, and in this case of budget allocation based on results, how can we balance? How can we balance this results based focus fairly to ensure that resources reach vulnerable groups where uh, interventions may require longer times and more resources. Thank you, Paula. I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm in Spain, but I was born in Colombia. I work for UNICEF Spain. Thank you. Roger or Ariela, would you like to answer Paola? I could do it. One point that we have worked on was the incentives. We created the fund for promoting performance. It's much more difficult for a very poor region to reach a poor region compared to an urban region or a more advanced region. One point is Incentive mechanism must ensure supplies for everyone. All in this case, healthcare centers have to have all the supplies. And the agreement we made with the different regions reward results in the poorer areas, not in the rich areas. It does it in the poor areas where things are more difficult. Two goals are negotiated, not imposed. It negotiated with each region. The Ministry of Finance and Economy and the Ministry of Social Inclusion have meetings to negotiate the goals to reach an agreement with a region. And there's te technical assistance to support it. Uh, for they are not penalized. Each region has its budget. The budget for achieving goals is additional. There's no penalty involved. The incentive mechanism enables visibilization of the more poor areas and the results there. One example, Loreto is the largest department in Peru. It looks like what Roger's photo shows, lots of rivers. Communication is via rivers and people live far away. When we did the anemia, I remember only 20% of the healthcare establishments had the necessary supplies. We made a challenge and we made, negotiated with Loreto. I was at that meeting and negotiated with Loreto and agreed that 45% of the establishments would have their micronutrients. Loreto worked hard and in a month, 80% of the establishment had their their supplies, supplies that they really need, the micronutrients. They did this motivated by the incentive in the first place. And secondly, because this kind of mechanism gives them the necessary landmarks for this production line to move along. And we found the health direction in Loreto to be very, very motivated by this result. And they realized that it was possible to do. Everything needs to be aligned to achieve things together and pull in the same direction. Roger. Yes, very briefly, there's a preconception I've seen in some countries, results-based budgeting doesn't consist of allocating more to the one who re achieves results. All these factors say you have to pr you have to prioritize, and the aim of the country is to develop fairly. So fairness is like the other side of the result, and this is as in the example that Adiela has just given you with performance 
promotion. We try to reduce this unfairness or this difference, inequity. Thanks. I'll give in a minute the floor to another participant. Looking through the questions, there are many questions related to the role of the different ministries and actors in this process. Somebody asked us about the Ministry of Education, to what degree does education become involved in this process? There are also questions about how to get the Ministry of Economy to be committed to a project of this kind. And somebody else asked whether it's necessary to have an autonomous agency or independent agency to coordinate. You did mention some of this, but I think it would be interesting Perhaps Miguel can talk about the Ministry of Economy and Finance. And Roger and Ariela could talk about the role of different ministries within the social area. Miguel, would you like to start? Sure. I think that for a long time, this idea has been ongoing of improving the quality of expenditure, especially facing in the past 10 years, the amount of budget resources have increased significantly in the country. Unfortunately, this has not been hand in hand with results. So one way of ensuring this has been to potentiate within the budget area, the direction of the quality of the expenditure, how to ensure that the resource is translated into results. Secondly, like any Ministry of Finance, you are subject to a huge amount of requests, everybody's asking for money. That's the usual. And one tool to avoid or allocate and get better results is saying, show me in this, but that how this budget you are requesting is going to improve the quality of life of the citizens. It's going to have results. Show me if there's an independent evaluation. I think this helps and has helped to discipline to a large extent the requests for greater resources, which traditionally are made at the ministry. <clears throat> I think it's important to have had an instance where there was creation of or a counterpart which shares the same principles of the ministry, which is when they created the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion. It was created largely with the thinking at that time of evidence-based interventions, logical frameworks. A lot of the personnel from the directorship of expenditure went into the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion. And this created the virtuous circle at that time, which I think has lasted over time. So from the standpoint of the Ministry of Economy and Finance, it's how to improve resource allocation, how to ensure results are obtained, not only thinking of the products, it's also important to consider this causality logic. Speaker is cut out. 
I think a symptom of this is that many Congress people, when the law budget was being discussed in Congress, asked to know why or asked to know about inclusion of programs, what was the reason for them. And there was a discussion which seemed to be completely foreign to the Congress. But I think this is part of this line of work. Ariel, if I'm right, focused at that time on achieving all of this. I think this continuity and this close relationship with the Ministry of Economy in this particular case I don't know if it has been unique as a country, but it has given us the results we've had so far, which are positive and encourage us to think that there are solutions to the challenges in the future. Roger, Ariela, anything about other ministries? I could say something about the process, perhaps, and Ariela could tell us something about the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion. To ensure the ministries participate right from the beginning of this relaunch results-based budgeting, the law of budgeting says the result is prioritized for 2021 is, is X, in this case, child development. Then the Ministry of Economy and Finance which has more capacity, publishes a standard saying, giving a term to the ministries, certain ministries, including the Ministry of Education, for example, should participate and approve the proposals for change. This way they are obliged to participate. This is a more institutional standpoint. So everybody is discussing, president, presenting evidence, for the design of the program, and then the implementation, implementation of it, which I already showed you in my presentation. Thinking about 2008, we worked a lot with Miguel. So I hope you're saying old because of our experience, not our age. On the first day when I arrived at the Ministry of Economy and Finance, we were five of us. Roger was the leader and Miguel was in the high director's ship. Our first topic was to provide indicators for the local governments, which are the, these are the most local governments in Peru. Three conditions for local governments so they would have their incentive. One, children should have their, their development checkups and the other should have their eye document. They had the territorial management, so it began to work. It worked quite well. We established that because we knew, knew these two things were very important for the models. So also the Ministry of Economy was saying it. We formed a group of tutors with what was the Ministry of Health and a group was formed between Ministry of Health and Ministry of Economy. This was key. Health problems are always, it's always assumed that Ministry of Education will solve education, Ministry of Health will solve health, but people's problems are multi-sectorial. They're not connected to one single ministry. Ministries make a product, but people need a whole set of products talking in budget terms in order to resolve their problems. So a team was formed to begin to manage a group of people in finance, thinking about results who would know the problem or the issue of chronic malnutrition. And then we had another group of people who knew about the budget cycle. Usually technical people don't know about this. So we had to join two languages, budgeting and technical. This was really important. 
when the guideline was established for early childhood development, 11 sectors took part, 11. We had for six months, a people of 60 technicians from the 11 sectors. From housing, mining, economy, health, education. So you have to think outside the box, not only childhood is not only uh, education and health, it's also roads, internet. We've seen about this today in the topic of schooling that communications is key, in this case, internet. We need a ministry who will articulate things. I've been vice minister and minister, but I think there shouldn't be a separate instance because even if it's somebody next to the president, this is my personal opinion. I don't believe in these instances led by individuals. We need, we do need presidential support, obviously, but this is at the executive branch level. And what we did was to create this group among a series of ministries to develop guidelines. And now after seven months, we have the results based budgeting program, which was created by all 11 ministries and signed by 11 ministers. We have developed a set of tools to enable working on a series of additional points, which are involved not only in health. The Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion is good for articulating things, but we need, as I say, a marriage because Ministry of Finance allocates resources, but it needs to be done linked to quality and quality means outcomes in people. The Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion in Latin America are kind of neutral ministries. This enables them to work on a model that can focus on citizens and can manage articulation. In the last phase of the results-based budgeting program, we're still consolidating how the governance should be organized. We need a ministry of the kind of development of social inclusion, which has to be modern, have information, and then we need a ministry of finance. They, both ministries should work together to be successful. The Fund for Promoting Performance signs agreements with the regions and it's signed by both ministries, Development and Social Inclusion and Economy and Finance. This is really important. We signed the agreement not only for health, but for health, education and housing. And the regional government decides where the money goes. So there is a long series of processes that have been developed and enabled regional governments to be very involved and very interested in achieving results. There's a political process. Uh, and for instance, people are very proud of having reduced anemia. Thank you so much. Clearly these topics of governance and coordination are essential. Sherry, you are. You can ask your question. You have access to a microphone. Panelists talk about the role of civil society organizations in the results-based budgeting process, if there has been any role. Thank you. And Sherry, if you don't mind letting the los panelistas responder. Who would like? To ask this question, there were several questions about the role of civil society. 
could some of you answer this, please? Ariela, if you like, I can go first. In the first stage of results-based budgeting, the role of civil society was fundamental to po politically position the result. From the Ministry of Finance, although we were looking at results, the reading of what was happening, of how the issue is positioned is important. So the arguments from civil society were powerful and that the president established a presidential goal of reducing chronic malnutrition to 16%. The this uh, achievement was attributed to civil society. Later on and considering the relaunched results-based budgeting from the Ministry of Finance, there has been greater involvement with issues of development agenda promoted in civil society. And on the other side, hand, based on evidence, they're essential to development. And so we have a kind of dialogue here. This relationship is not formalized, both in the first and second stages, it's not, are not established in the steps of bureaucracy or the results-based budgeting originally or relaunched by looking at that standard now the legislative degree and directives that were issued in 2020 so civil society does not have an explicit role so i wonder and i don't know the answer should it should civil society be regulated from the state or not given the good lessons learned in the first stage and the excellent contributions made because in practice civil society is always connected either through specialists who contribute to the process a sector is accompanied by a specialist from civil society but it's not a formal procedure i'm just reflecting aloud it's not formalized we haven't yet channeled this great learning that we had in the first stage, that lesson learned at the end of the dictatorship in Peru, like connection with society and the state has to have wide open doors, formal doors, established doors, which will enrich the process so that they are not simply centralized technocracies deciding which way the public resources are allocated. So this is more of a reflection uh, regarding this question, more than an answer. I agree with Roger. Civil society participated originally with priority actions for childhood. They accelerated, helped to the presidential goal. Today, there are also civil society organizations working strongly, but in Peru, we have an intermediate instance. Mesa de Concertación, round table for struggle against poverty. This includes government and civil society, but it has autonomy. At this round table, there have been monitoring groups, not citizen surveillance. There are groups of concerted follow-up of the programs for anemia and so on. They write regular reports where civil society actively takes part. This is a good channel. But as Roger says, we have not yet consolidated this meeting place between civil society and the state. So that civil society can also participate in some decisions. It's true in the regions not so much at a national level, but more local. Civil society participates actively. They have a series of, of groups and we have done a lot of work together, but yes, we still need to institutionalize this. I would like to add, not necessarily on results-based budgeting, but there's something called participative budgeting. If you analyze this, it's more like saluting the flag. 
improvements have not necessarily out come from this or the actual real voice of citizens has not really been incorporated really to the budgeting. It's more you like, oh, I, I asked civil society, but now I'm going to do what I was thinking about anyway. It's important because it gives legitimacy to the resource allocation process. Yes, I think this issue is present in most or all countries in the region. I want to also invite Manuel Mendez, who has a very interesting question. Manuel. I, I'm not sure if Manuel is listening to us then. We'll see if he reacts. But anyway, I will ask, meanwhile, another question, which includes questions from several people related to information system. The need to... All what you're telling us about is very data intensive. What kind of investments are required in this regard? And real, what are the real mechanisms to ensure and monitor the quality with which the services are being delivered? I know Manuel is enabled now, but let's answer the question I just asked first, and then we'll give him the floor to Manuel. Who could comment on the topic of information and follow up of quality of the services? I can start. Information in Peru, as from 2008, was organized. There was information, but it was organized regarding results and production line. First, we have a national health survey every year, which not many countries have, even nearby countries. Some countries in Latin America have surveys every four or five years about chronic malnutrition, so that doesn't really help for defining policies. So here we have a yearly health survey. But this is the autopsy of what has happened, as we say, and what we have is a series of indicators which arise from administrative systems that show us coverage of the products that we have selected and some quality data, because this all goes through administrative systems. Some indicators are measured every six months, others are monthly, and some can be measured daily, on a daily basis, like micronutrient supplement can be checked every day and other supply issues. So we have availability. If you look at the MIDI's website, the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion, it has a platform called Red Informa, a, a page that you can follow the data. And if you look at the district, you have all the details of what there is available or certain quality standards, which are shared by different ministries such that we can see these are being classified by red, yellow, and green because that panel is for people who are not epidemiologists. It's for any citizen to see and also, obviously, for local authorities. So we have different colors. When I was a minister, mayors would visit me and I would look at the page with them and I would say, look, your pneumococcus or rotavirus vaccine is in red. 
so you don't have enough people vaccinated. And then they would say, what should I do? I'm an engineer. Well, go to the center, the medical center, speak to the doctors, the physicians, and talk about the situation. And, I, and then they would say, well, what should I ask? So information alone is not enough. You need to have knowledge enough to understand the information. And this has progressed a lot in, in Peru. There's very much information, data which have been published by the ministry which can help. And we are trying that local uh, civil servants, civil society and mayors can have access to this information. And then we have also achieved a lot of transparency in finances. There's an open site which can be viewed daily. There's a lot of information showing how this is progressing. Roger, do you want to say anything else? Yes. Just we're talking about what investments are needing and what have we done? Because Ariela has told us about service management Financial information in all countries have integrated systems of financial information, but the purpose is to control fiscal balance. It has financial aims, not management aims. Management is to do with real information, services, products, processes linked to results. So we do need a lot of investment and changing the CF or moving to a CF, CIAF connected to an information system which links the financial information to the non-financial information. We had, in Peru, we had SIA, System for Integrated Administration of Information, and this was increased via incentives. And then we had, it through this, information about supplies, but we haven't connected information about supplies, about supply management with formulation, preparation, execution, and logistics have not been connected to the information, financial information. There's a gap. And so here we have room to work. There's an administrative system called supply system now. And this is an administrative unit more consolidated, which will drive this connection because they are trying to connect financial management to process management. This is still pending for Peru. We don't have much to show in information systems within budgets but of linking financial and operative areas as there have been generative indicators and the availability of some supplies. Again, this is something we still need to do. There's a wide gap. There are gigabytes of information which have to travel in real time. It's no use having an Excel information two months later when the budget preparation has been closed. It's also no use to know that there's a lack of supply of vaccines a week after the children should have been vaccinated. So these are all challenges that we need to address, identify these gaps, invest and mobilize. This is also part of the decisions that should be taken for our results-based budgeting 2.0. And this is part of what we need to do. We have a system, different systems, administrative systems, which do not necessarily uh, converse or communicate as they should. Another one. Public expenditure is spent on payroll and this is not necessarily converse with other, as with other sections of expenditure, which is higher in the state. Whatever is done at level of supply, logistics, and information that needs to flow in both direction is still pending. In Peru, great effort was made. It was done even during the transition government 20 years ago, 
where they created the user-friendly consultation. Where any person can go in and see what is being spent on what, on what money is being spent on. And I think we are a reference in terms of access to information. We still need to take the next step to have an integrated system of information for decision making and for accountability so that in any city you could see what was going where. There are initiatives, for instance, a platform was created called Info Obras so that citizens can include information of physical progress of construction work. And I think we're moving towards this about having more precise real-time information, not only for public policy makers, but also for the citizens. Well, I'm afraid time is up and I'm sorry because I can see there are so many more questions and we could carry on for hours. I'm sorry, I apologize to Manuel who finally managed to connect, but sadly we don't have time left to continue. So it will be pending. As a final reflection, the experience of Peru, in result-based budgeting in early childhood development is extremely interesting. And I believe it has lessons for many other countries in different state levels of development of state organization to take on an effort of this kind. I also believe that Today's conversation showed us the huge value of being able to make use of the experience and the perspectives of people who have had hands-on experience in thinking and organizing and developing these programs. Having had Ariela Roger and Miguel for an hour and a half talking to us shows me that there is a lot to learn and great value in generating opportunities of this type of meeting where we can benefit from the experience, the concrete experience in this case of Peru. This encourages us to continue to move forward we, owing, we owe you, many of the participants, for not having been able to ask all the questions, but I know that if you want to send us emails with your questions, all three panelists will be happy to respond. And we also have the challenge of the translation of the document and the PowerPoint and so on. So, Finally, I want to ask Monica and Shekufe or Elizabeth to uh, say a few words and then we will release you. It has been an excellent conversation. We hope to continue. Thank you, everyone. I know we're a little late. Thank you so much, Luis, Roger, Ariela. Thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thanks, goodbye. Monica, will you say something? Okay, so goodbye and until next time. Thank you, bye.